Thank you for thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be in North Carolina, and uh, I want to thank the Jesse Holmes Center and Wingate uh, University for for having me here today. I want to tell you a little bit about my story as a context to explain to you what I do today. Uh, I am. I was born in Puerto Rico in the 1960s, and I was born into a communist household. My father was founding member of the Puerto Rican Communist Party. He was there in 1959 with other 15 men where they started the Communist Party of Puerto Rico, a party that was heavily, heavily uh, associated with the Cuban Revolution. I, I grew up seeing my father going to Cuba regularly, um, making us listen to the never-ending speeches of Fidel Castro. I mean, seven-hour speeches when you're five years old, you have to sit down and listen to. And listening to my father uh, harangues against Yankee imperialism and American capitalism and how we needed to destroy America. He used to tell us that America was the enemy of the human race. And every good, decent person will fight to destroy this country. And I believe him. It's my dad. <laughs> I believe what he told me. Uh, I had many memories during those days of my mother crying because my father used to tell her uh, that he will give the lives of these four kids we have at home for revolution. And she will start crying and we will come and console her. You know, but deep inside of me, I wanted that kind of commitment to a cause. I, I, I sided with that. I wanted that for me. It was something that made us special. We thought that we were this embattled community that one day will erase the, 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 the injustices of this world, and then uh, heaven will come on earth. Uh, many other uh, situations happened during those days. I probably was six years old in the night when my mother was already crying again. And in the middle of the night, she gets out of the, the, the home to talk with two men who were stationed in a car. They were always there. Uh, you can imagine when you are five or six years old and you see your mother in, leaving the home in the middle of the night. You don't know if she's coming back. And many years later, I found out that they were FBI agents that were always after my father. And I hated them. I hated them, and I blamed them for the poverty of the Puerto Rico of the 1960s. I, blamed, I hated and blamed them for the bad marriage between mom and dad, because you know my father was all about a revolution, and my mom was about how I feed these four kids we have. We, you cannot keep a job, because every time he will try to get a, a employment, here comes the FBI behind, and he would not get the employment. The reality is that he was something else. He was, I have at home his FBI file denoting 40 years of communist activity, uh, four cases for terrorism. He was a soldier for revolution. So that was our, our existence early on in, in our life. My father fighting against this country and me learning from him, learning the catechism of Marxism, from, from a very soft, intellectually sophisticated man who was also dedicated to that cause. And at the same time, my mother was, well, a, a humble Puerto Rican woman of the 1960s. She, 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 if he says we are communists, okay, we are communists. She, she didn't care about, about politics. Again, she only cared about her family. And at the same time, she would sneak us to go to mass with friends without my father knowing about it. Because my father was an atheist who believed that religion is the opium of the people, who keeps you thinking on heaven while the capitalists are having a good time here on earth, as my father used to say. So he would, she would sneak us to go to mass with friends without him knowing. And I sort of developed a, a kind of, of double consciousness. On one side, Marx. On the other side, Jesus. You know? I had revolution and the kingdom of God. And that was a very, very difficult time because it was a very confusing time. I went to the University of Puerto Rico to study political science because I wanted to intellectually defeat America. That was my goal. I joined the party with him. 
and I probably have my FBI file somewhere <laughs> in some office in, in Washington. Because I barely graduated from the university, not because I had bad grades, but because I was always rebel rousing. I was always doing some kind of a rally and trying to become a revolutionary. You know, I can say that my heart was sown with the thread of utopia from the very beginning. I was a Marxist because everything in our community, in our home, was about Marxism. You know, I always laugh about these American revolutionaries, this cafe latte, iPhone holding, uh, selfie taking, let's go to the gap after the rally revolutionaries. <laughs> Uh, the best place in the world to be a revolutionary is America. It's the best place to be a communist. You can think like a communist, you just don't have to live like a communist. <laughs> but, but our life was really dedicated at that cause. But I had that double consciousness. Eventually, I wanted to merge that double consciousness. And what was a good Catholic communist boy to do, I eventually joined the Jesuit order, of course. <laughs> All the Jesuits were Marxist, and I, I, I thought that I could have my cake and eat it too. I could play religion, and I could also be a Marxist at the same time. This is in the 1980s. Most of you probably were not born. Mid-1980s, and revolution was brewing in Central America. A liberation theology was really infecting all of Central and South America, and I was going to be part of that movement. My father, who was an atheist, was happy for me because he knew who the Jesuits were. So he was like jealous that I was going to go to Nicaragua. That's where they were, going, they were going to send me to do my philosophy studies after I did my first vows as a, as a Jesuit, in the, in the way to become a Jesuit priest. Uh, I was going to go to the heart of the revolution, Sandinista, Nicaragua. And I was going to study liberation theology from the masters of liberation theology, those men who invented liberation theology, Ignacio Yacuría, Juan Luis Segundo, Gustavo Gutierrez, all these men were the priests who went to Europe to the great universities in Rome and Tübingen and other places, and they, they created this idea of the merging of Marxist philosophy with Christianity that they call liberation theology. And they later descended over Central America and began to spread that gospel. So I was looking forward to, do, to go to the University of El Salvador that was right there in the border between El Salvador and Nicaragua. But it, it never happened. You don't remember, the older ones here do, the seven Jesuits who were murdered in El Salvador in 1987. And I was going to be living in the home where they were massacred. And out of concern for our safety, they decided not to send us to Nicaragua. They wanted to send me to Fordham here in the United States. And I told the priest, I'm not going to America. I hate America. I'd not go into the guts of the monster, as we used to call the United States in those days. And I went back to Puerto Rico, my, my, my hometown in Isabela, Puerto Rico, frustrated, angry, because I could not go to Nicaragua to be a revolutionary. You know, I did not have a vocation to be a priest. I had a desire to be a, a Sandinista revolutionary priest in Nicaragua fighting America, which is a totally different story. When that did not happen, I was frustrated and eventually decided to come to America anyway. A friend of mine told me, Ismael, I, ha I went there, I have friends, we could give you shelter, it's going to be less costly for you, you should go and further your studies. And I decided to come to America and I landed at the University of Southern Mississippi of all places. <laughs> You can imagine this black Puerto Rican boy who hates America lands in Dixie. <laughs> oh, my, my fears uh, were going to happen. You know, I could not take, I could not understand the southern draw. I had to go to class with a, with a machine to try to record the classes and go back to my, to my apartment and try to listen again and again to see if I could understand what they were saying. I could not take the food that thing that you call coffee, you know, that black water that you <laughs> put in the cup. 
I, it was really a, a cultural shock for me. At the same time, I always say that when I landed here in America, my lungs were filled with the breath of freedom. Even though at that time, I would never have accepted that. Something happened to me when I came here. For the first time in my life, I had the opportunity to, to challenge the safe assumptions of my ideology with, with, with the spark of reality. You know, ideologies are like, like a pair of glasses you put on yourself. You know, it's, it's a prism through which you look at reality and you interpret reality. And you and I can be looking at the same reality and we will see different things simply because we have a different prism. And it's so difficult to take away those comfortable glasses and put on a new pair. It's challenging. And especially for a, a true Marxist as I was, because my life was Marxism. That was a quasi-religion for me. All my relationships were Marxist, so it was very difficult. But something happened in America, some experiences that helped me challenge Again, the safe assumptions of my ideology. <clears throat> and the first thing that happened to me was that, you know, I had good grades, even though I could barely speak English at that time. And they called me to the dean's office and they offered me a full assistantship, paying me all my studies. And I said, you know, this is not supposed to be happening. You know, I hate their guts and they're rewarding me. And, but something happened to me at that time. I began to dimly realize that there is a connection between reward and accomplishment. That I, as an individual human person, had meaning. As a Marxist, your dignity lies in being like a, a, a faithful drop in a great wave, the great wave of revolution. And if you are a faithful revolutionary, if you are a faithful drop, your life has meaning. But apart from that wave, you mean nothing. You are just a curious accumulation of atoms destined to nothingness. That's what you are. So my, my, life, my, my identity was a collectivized understanding of the human self. But in America, I began to understand that that is a lie that each one of us is unique and unrepeatable, made in the very image and likeness of God with the moral capacity of self-realization. Each one of us is an individual, and we have the, that capacity of transforming our environment because we have reason, and through reason, we can discover entire universes. We can know the truth. Imagine the computer, the iPhone, that started in the mind of someone. It did not exist in reality. It started in the mind, and from the mind eventually became a reality. And in that capacity, we mirror our creator himself, who is the logos, reason itself. And we also have another capacity, the capacity to choose, the volitional capacity of moving ourselves in one direction or the other direction. And that capacity is important. That really makes us co-creators. We can put our hands in reality, in the dirt, and we can transform reality and make it something different than what it is. So I began to discover my, me as myself as an individual with that moral capacity of self-realization to reason, to know the truth, and do the good. And there lies our dignity in knowing the truth and doing the good. And that began to happen to me. I began to discover that reality about myself. And that is a reality that you, young people, had to one day discover. You had to discover who you are as individuals. Of course, you are not atomized individuals separated from their environment. But everything starts with you as a human person that is unique and unrepeatable. Something else happened to me is that, it, you know, this thing that you call poverty here in America is a joke. <laughs> I mean, you compare the poverty of the 1960s Puerto Rico with the poorest state of the United States. I said, give me some of that poverty, please. <laughs> I want it. 
You know, in reality, there was, I began to see that we in America, we don't really know what poverty is. And, and we, we, are, we are bored in our affluence. We are so bored in our own affluence that we start trying to recreate society at the image that is only in our minds and we don't realize that we have what it takes. We have a good society. We have to change. It's not perfect, but it's a good society. But it's so, we are so bored in our affluence that we need to invent something different. And I began to realize those things, and at the same time, I was losing my father. My father was a communist. He died a communist. He will never surrender his ideas. And the last few years of our lives, we were not even in speaking terms because my father could not understand how the most radical of his sons had basically joined the enemy. Remember, being a real communist and surrendering that idea is betrayal. It's betraying who I was. But I couldn't do it otherwise. I was beginning to realize and discover certain things here that, that challenge again those safe assumptions that I have learned from my dad. At the same time, before he died, he told me, he called me to Puerto Rico, and I went, I visited him at his deathbed, and he told me, Ismael, I don't accept what you have embraced, and I don't even understand it, but you better fight for it. Don't be a fence sitter, he told me, because he never was. And I think that's the, the seal that we need to recapture in America, the seal for something that is greater than yourself. We talk about faith, we talk about freedom, and it becomes just a buzzword, a politicized nonsense that we talk when the elections are coming. You know, and you see an ad on the TV and they put the flag, you know, the flag there to make you feel good about your country. But freedom is more than that. But I began to, to have these experiences and I joined America and began to work in ministry. I began to also discover my own faith. And to my surprise, as I surrender these ideas of Marxism at great personal cost, I see many of you Americans embracing them. <laughs> it's sometimes even while we try to help the poor ourselves. We really have been working among the poor with assumptions that are false. For example, I went to, to work in the ministry in the Catholic Church and what we were doing paying people's bills and giving them stuff. And that's what we call compassion in America. We give people stuff, we give them more free stuff, and more free stuff, and sometimes under the weight of the free stuff we dump at people lies their dignity, waiting to be awakened, waiting to be discovered. Instead of looking at people as Engines of wealth creation, waiting for someone to come and crank that engine and let it be, we treat people as passive recipients of magnanimity. You stand in line, someone pays your bills, you know, you give me food, the other give me clothing, you pay my bills, you pay my mortgage, uh, turkeys are flying all over the place during Thanksgiving, you know, someone gives me the toys for Christmas. Why bother getting out of poverty? Nothing is broken. My life is okay. No, there's no problem. You know, we, we have confused people. We have, we have instrumentalized the poor in the way that they become the desired satisfaction. We sometimes treat the poor as we treat our pets. You know, you have a pet, and you put a bowl of food there on the side of the, 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 in the corner, and your pet comes every day for his food. And you pat the pet on the head and it makes you feel good. And you do it again and again and again. But human beings are more than animals. We are more than bodies to be clothed and mouths to be fed. Again, we are human beings with that moral capacity of self-realization. It took me some time to realize this. I was in Catholic ministry and one day I was sitting at my desk and I began to see at the line of people who were coming for food in my ministry. And when I look at the line, I began to see the children of those that have been getting food from our ministry coming themselves for food, them, for food. And I realized at that moment that I was part of the problem. 
I was part of a system that perpetuates poverty. We feed on poverty. You know, if your ministry or your organization is about food distribution, what do you need? More hungry mouse or less hungry mouse if your budget is going to go up? You need more hungry people. Because that is what's going to bring resources to your organization, and you repeat it again and again and again, and then you are invested in the very problem that you are supposed to fix. And then what happens with the poor? They become dependent on you. So eventually, I left that ministry. I quit one day. I, did, I realized that I was part of that problem part of that cycle of dependency that disrespects the poor. I don't want you to feel sorry for us. I don't want, especially us in the minority community, I'm tired of people, people feeling sorry for us. What about starting to respect the poor? Start to respect them as full human beings capable of changing their lives by the choices they make. That is authentic love for the poor. When you see a person and instead of telling that person, how may I help you? You tell them, you know, I'm so glad that you are here. We need you. Imagine if you are a poor person coming for food and needs and instead of receiving that, how may I help you? Someone tells you, I need you. Imagine what that does to that person. How that radically changes the perspectives on the life of that person. Let me give you an example. What we have been doing in America. I'm walking down the street with a sandwich in my hands, and I look to the side of the road, and I see a hungry person in need. And voluntarily, I deprive myself of what is mine, my sandwich, and I give it to the poor person. That is true compassion. It was my property, and I chose to take it from myself and give it to that person. I'll do it again, because I know I did the right thing, and it felt good in that order. In that order, that's important. It's, you know what happens? Most of the time, we feel good about supposedly helping people. We go from the heart to the muscle. We feel sorry for people, we don't stuff at them. We need to start here in the mind with an intelligent assessment of what are the real needs of the poor. And then you go to the heart, and eventually you move into action. But the person who gives the gifts will give it again. And the person who receives the gift says, you know, this guy didn't have to give me this sandwich. It was his, and now it's mine. Maybe I changed my, mind, my life. Maybe I can do the same for someone else. Suddenly, two strangers become brothers. There is a community that has been voluntarily formed. But this is what we do in America. I'm walking down the street with my sandwich, minding my business. I see a person on the side of the road, hungry. And before I can do anything, here comes running the government commissar. He snatches the sandwich from my hands, and he gives it to the poor person. That's a totally different scenario that we have here. Instead of having a community, what you have? Resentment. It was mine, and someone else took it from me, and they decided what to do with my gift. You know? What will I do next time? I'll hide my sandwich. And that's what we do you know, in April, every April. I don't see anyone hiring a CPA to pay more taxes at the end of the year. You hire a CPA because you plan to pay less taxes. You, know? you hide your sandwich. And you stay a stranger from the poor. I pay my taxes. They take care of the poor. Let, let someone else touch the poor. I already help them with my, with my forcibly taken money. And the person who receives the, the gift feels no gratitude. It's my sandwich. The good commissar gave it to me. It belongs to me. In fact, you expect me to eat the sandwich without a drink? No, go back and take more from the same guy from whom you took the sandwich so I can have my own. So the gift becomes what? An entitlement, a never-ending entitlement. And what happens? Bureaucracies grow. Bureaucracies. The, the love for the poor does not get bigger. 
bureaucracies get bigger. Of every $3 that go into the federal government to help the poor in America, only $1 ever reaches the hands of the poor. The other $2 are eaten up by the bureaucracies of the state. And only people can love people. Bureaucracies cannot love people. You know what bureaucracy is? It's the natural human response to complexity. That's all what it is. When things are very complicated, what do I do? I don't give you a name. I don't try to know you as a unique person. I give you a number, no? Because I can deal with numbers. I can, I, I, I can make sense of numbers. And then I generalize criteria. I don't attend your unique, specific needs as a unique person. I know you need food. I know you need shelter. I generalize the criteria and treat people like we treat the dogs. You, know, you go to a government agency, what's your social, how much you make, here's the reward for your poverty, a check. Here's the reward. You know, one of the joys of my life in my ministry is to speak with older African-American men. And you know what they tell me? They tell me two things. Number one, they hate the segregation. And who wouldn't, you know? They hate it that they live in a society that really oppressed them. No one will want to be feeling inferior in a society. But you know what is the second thing that they tell me? That they love segregation and they miss segregation. You know why? Because in those days, because they knew that the outer society was not going to help them, they bond together. And they created their own businesses, their own associations, their own groups. They helped each other. And in the presence of oppression, they helped. They had a strong, although poor, community. But here comes the government now with a check in the hand. You know? and, 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 and destroyed that bond of community. There were, two co there were two societies in the black community in those days that helped them in the times of need. Number one was the family. And number two was the church. But there was a moral expectation attached to the gift. You will, you will go to your pastor, the pastor will tell you, I'll help you, but I want to see you on Sunday. You better treat that woman right. You better stay in the straight and narrow. So there was a moral expectation attached to the gift and that kept the society strong. But then what happened in the 1960s? We changed our minds about the poor. You know what we thought about the poor? Oh, the poor, you know, they don't have what it takes, or they're so, so weak that, that they don't have the, the, the inclination or the resources to engage in second order change, to change their lives and get out of poverty. So what is a good society to do? We will plug every hole of need that they have, and then now all their basic needs are met, and now they will engage in changing, excess, in changing activity. But that's a lie. You know that's not the human person. If you, if you take care of me, I let you. <laughs> if you meet all my needs at this level, I will stay at that level. Because my needs are being met, and I don't want to risk that. But what happens with the human person precisely because we have that moral capacity of self-realization? If you raise the expectation, people raise to the expectation. Sometimes it's a struggle, but they raise to the expectation. And that is the, what we need to change in the way we look at the poor. In my church, for example, Christmas is coming. And you know what we do? We put the Christmas tree in the back of the church. The Christmas tree has a piece of paper with a name. And the next Sunday, I bring the bike. You know? I never met that family. I don't want to meet that family. I just want to feel good about myself. I bring the bike. And then we have a bureaucracy in the church. They grab the bike, and they dirty their hands with the poor. I stay here justified, feeling good about myself, but not really having an encounter with free individuals. And that is what I want for my people. 
for people who are poor, the, the opportunity to, to live freedom to the fullest, to have the opportunities to engage in activity that will change their lives, to engage in activities that respect the full scope of human dignity. What is human dignity? That we are, as human beings, exceptionals in the universe because we have not only the moral capa the capacity of reason and choice, what we call existen uh, intrinsic dignity, but we actually make choices, what we call existential dignity. And that is the dignity that we give to ourselves by the choices we make. Another example for you. Five years ago, I attended a free distribution of school supplies. And everyone was just so happy that the kids were getting their school supplies for, for, for school. And what did I see there? A, a sea of black and brown faces getting the free cheap school supplies from a small cadre of white people. <laughs> and I said, you know, there's something wrong here. Number one, why is always us at the receiving end? I want to be at the giving end. It feels better. <laughs> well, how can that happen? It dawned on me, we need to make the kids productive. That's the answer. If the kids become productive, then we help them meet their own needs. Instead of you stand in line on Saturday when we tell you to be, and you stand there, and we give their stuff. And then you stand in line, and you smile at them. They, you hate their guts, but they have the good stuff. And then you grab their stuff, you go home, and you don't take care of it, it didn't cost you anything. And they, you go back, and they'll give you more stuff. The good strangers. The good strangers will give you more stuff. So we started what we call now a self-reliance club. Why? Because we did not want that. What were the kids learning? The kids were learning that there is benefit at the end of the long lines of dependency. That's what they were learning. And we did not want that because that is paternalistic, condescending, and disrespectful. So we started the self-reliance clubs. The kids joined the club at their school site. They work in all kinds of fun entrepreneurial initiatives at their school site. They do gardening, farming. They do arts and crafts. They create wealth. And we pay them for their work. They put 50 hours of work for the school year, and we teach them economics through a website a system. They learn economics, they work, they earn money, and at the end of the school year, we have this massive uh, field trip to a bank where we hand them their earnings at the door. They go and open their own savings account, and now they can buy their own school supplies. They can say now, I stand tall and say, I, I earn this. My life is in this object. This object represents my sacrifice. And they learn that they are, they are the answer to their own problems. They are not scenery in the drama of my good intentions. They are the protagonists of their own stories of success. That is what I want for the poor. So that is the belief of the Freedom and Virtue Institute. Enough of feeling sorry for people, even for in the issues of race. In America, we have gone from exclusion because of race, evil exclusion because of race, to inclusion because of race, sometimes even degrading inclusion. And in the meantime, we forgot about the, about the person in front of us. The person in front of us he has been lost in an expansive and yet shallow sea of color. That, enough of that. You know, I don't want you to exclude me because of my race, but don't give me brownie points because of my race either. No, treat me as a full human being and as an individual. I have a daughter. My wife is from Southside Chicago, African American. I'm Hispanic, Puerto Rican, black. She's a girl, we're covered, I tell you. <laughs> but you know what, she, she went to college and the applications for college, you know, she, they asked her what was her race and she wrote, none of your business. <laughs> no, <laughs> what does that have to do with my, 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 my school application? 
You know, see me as an individual human being. You know, look at my grades and judge me as everyone else. And when we do that, we discover that race is inconsequential. Racism is evil. It's evil. But you know what's the problem in America worse than racism? Racialism. The inordinate attention to the inconsequence of race. That is the problem. When we make race the heart of our identity, that is the problem. Because we are more than that. And the same happens with class. We had this competition between the rich and the poor. There's no competition. What we need is to create our own pies instead of start looking at the size of the pie of my neighbor. <laughs> Help people create their own opportunities in life. And that's what the Freedom and Virtue Institute is all about. It's a new way of looking at human dignity, a new way of looking at the service to the poor that encourages people to become all they have been called to be. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be more than glad to, to answer them.